Okay, so the general purpose of this is uh, how can we determine the topology and the metric, in particular, I'm interested in the metric on complicated structures in space-time using like a radar type device. So for instance, we would like to simulate or know what's happening to the other side, this is science fiction at the moment, of a wormhole. Wormholes have not been found yet. And on the right you have a picture, sorry. You have a picture of uh, an electromagnetic wormhole which can be simulated, and this is work with Alan Greenleaf, uh, Slava Kurilev and Mati Lassos. There are different simulations of electromagnetic wormholes. The other aspect of the, some of the talks you will hear this week, especially Mati Lassos on Friday, which is, corresponds to what I call active measurements, is that uh, nonlinearity helps to solve inverse problems. For, for instance, in this case, the interaction of several waves produces new waves. And these new waves give you information about the inverse problem. For instance, in this particular case, this is a very simple model, nonlinear PD. We can do this for Einstein's equation, as Matthew will show. If A is non-zero, so the nonlinearity is present, then this new wave is formed. And we can solve the inverse problem in this case to recover, for instance, C, the sound speed, given sufficiently many data, F, sources. But the linearized problem, when A is equal to zero, we don't know how to solve. So the, my talk is mainly concentrated with passive measurements. As I mentioned, uh, Mati will talk about active measurements on Friday. So it's difficult to actually define what you mean by inverse problem with passive or active measurements. But let me give some examples. For instance, earthquakes is an example of passive measurements. They are produced naturally in the Earth. Very unfortunate. They produce a lot of damage and death and so on. However, they give information about the inner structure of the Earth. So by measuring travel times of seismic waves joining different seismic stations around the Earth, uh, you can say something about the, the, the formation, for instance, the inner core of the Earth. Because these waves are very strong and penetrate deeply through the Earth. In medical imaging, an example of passive measurements is magnetoencephalography that measures the brain activity. For instance, you want to find whether there is a problem in the brain, a tumor or epilepsy, a source of epilepsy, and so on. This is imaged by measuring magnetic fields produced by the electrical currents in the brain. So I like to say some people produce stronger magnetic fields than others. And an ex another example of uh, active measurements in, in geophysics is oil prospection, is to find oil. Most of the oil is uh, found in the sea. There is a ship with a long tail here where they have produced sources or guns of sound, and you measure the reflections. In particular, the travel times of the reflections, and from that you try to find the, the structure here, in particular whether there is oil. And in medical imaging, ultrasound is a prime example of uh, active measurement. You send sound waves, and the frequency is very different now than in the case of oil prospection, very high frequency waves, and you measure the echoes, and then they produce an image of the interior of the womb of a female that you can see. That's a standard procedure nowadays for pregnant women. Okay, so in, in general relativity, the, the, the very ambitious question is, can you recover the structure of space-time when we see light coming from many point sources varying in time? 
sometimes takes billions of years to take to arrive in the Earth. And now, since 2015, we have been observing uh, gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are earthquakes of the universe. So they give you information about the universe. And the problem with that, for, uh, particularly with uh, light sources, is gravitational lensing. As the general theory of relativity says, there is a large mass, space time warps. And then the rays of light are deflected and they produce conjugate points, so several sources coming to the same observer. And you create images like this. You can see images like this, like the Einstein cross, four different images of the same star. That's one of the problems. Like an example that I like very much is the double Einstein ring that's produced when the mass, the star that you want to serve, there is a large mass in between the observer, the, the star, and the, and the object that you want to serve. They're aligned approximately. And light doesn't know where to go, and it goes in a ring and forms this double ring. And this is very similar to a phenomenon known in optics as conical refraction. In certain crystals called biaxial crystals, if you shoot a ray of light in the direction of the optic axis of the crystal, it splits into a cone. It's, and then you can see exactly the same, the double ring separated by a dark ring. And both phenomena are related in some way. Of course, now we have, as I mentioned, gravitational waves for passive measurements since uh, 2015. Okay, so how to model this uh, type of passive measurements? So here is the, on the, the black region is the one that we want to image determine the metric, for instance, here, or even the topology or the differential structure. And in the blue rectangle here is, is where we are observing. Of course, this is in space-time. And then uh, this light produces wave fronts, for instance, from this point in red. And you intersect the wave fronts, the different wave fronts, with the region of observation. And this is what I want to make a precise definition of. And for that, I introduced the standard concepts of Lorentzian geometry. So it, it, you have a, a Minkowski space and plus one dimensional Minkowski space. The metric is a signature minus plus 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 minus dz squared plus dx squared. The null vectors the, are on the, the light cone where the metric vanishes, and the plus and the minus indicate the future light cone and the backward light, light cone, starting at the point Q. In general, we have an n plus one dimensional manifold. Lorentzian is the signature is minus plus plus plus. Uh, we always assume time orientation. Uh, the null geodesic starts at the point Q. You follow the geodesic here using the exponential map. And these are null. So they are in the light cone. And this is the future light cone in this case. Corresponds to the previous definition in Minkowski space. Okay. And again, here we have the, uh, and I will, now take four-dimensional oriented Lorentzian manifold. LQ plus, again, is the future or past pointing light-like light vectors on the light cone, or the backward light cone. Causal vectors are the collection of time-like and light-like vectors. Time-like is the uh, metric is negative inside. This, uh, I will mention this as this. The solid cone, the light cone is the boundary. And a curve is time-like, light-like, causally. The tangent vectors are time-like, light-like, causal. This is a standard 
definitions of Lorentzian manifold. I just want to fix the notation here. And if you have a, a point P, the chronological future, uh, this is the notation, the standard notation also, uh, P much less than Q means it can be joined by future pointing time-like curves. And P strictly less than Q means it can be joined by future pointing causal curves, so on the light curve. You have the chronological future, this is our future of the point P, and the causal feature is uh, the one inside. And then these intersections are very important, will be very important. In particular, the IPQ, which the, is the intersection of the forward uh, light cone, solid cone coming from P, and the backward solid cone coming from Q. This is the, the diamond, this is, will refer, be referred as the diamond causal cone. It's a diamond. Okay, so this is the main assumption that we'll have throughout the global hyperbolicity, so that you cannot go to the future and come back. There are no close, no close causal paths. And this set that I mentioned before, this JPQ, which is indicated here, is compact. In that case, it has been shown that if the manifold is isometric to, is some, to a product manifold that has this particular metric, this is very useful for the analysis in globally hyperbolic spaces, looks very similar to, uh, to Minkowski metric, except that you have, of course, this factor and that depends on time, non-zero, and this uh, Riemannian metric for every t. And so we usually denote the point x by t and y, and they, they, they are referred also as coordinates x0, x1, x2, x3. Again, most of the time I will be in four-dimensional space-time. Okay, so here comes the, the main uh, definition of what I, I want to measure. So this is the set, the set W is the one I want to determine. And this, you send light from points in W, in particular the light cone. Take the forward light cone coming from the point Q, is where the wave fronts come in from these different points in Q, and you intersect it with the region of observation. So V, you had two points, P minus and P plus on a, time, on a time like geodesic. This is the life, it's like an observer, the time line of an observer, take a neighborhood, you intersect this light cone with this neighborhood, and these sets as what we're going to measure. Of course, this is an idealized uh, situation, but we have to start somewhere. And, and this can be very complicated. Of course, here he has been drawn to be straight because of gravitational lensing, they can turn around uh, <coughs> and develop singularities. I have many complicated fissures, but for that, we take the earliest light observation set. So the first time that this, the fusion light cone intersects this set V, which is the neighborhood of a time-like geodesic. And in the physics literature for different purposes, this has been called light cone cuts. And the name makes sense because this is a cut. And here in, you're cutting this, this set by this light cone. And this was defined by Engel and Horowitz after we did, but however, it was published before. This is usual in physics. The papers, this paper took eight years, four years to get published. 
Okay, on the theorem is the following. Suppose you have an open, smooth, globally hyperbolic Lorentzian manifold of dimension big or equal than three, and you have two points of a time-like geodesic. You take a neighborhood of this time-like geodesic, and then you have a relatively compact set in space-time. Assume that we know the earliest observation set then we can determine the topological structure, the differential structure, and the conformal structure of W up to diffeomorphies. Of course, all of these are invariant concepts or invariant under changes of variables. And let me mention that you can only recover at, at best the conformal structure because the light cone is the same if you multiply the metric by a factor. You're looking at null geodesics, where the metric vanishes. So that's, that's the same set. You multiply the metric with the same fact. Okay. Uh, let me just talk a little bit how to recover the conformal class. I'm not going to give uh, many proofs here. <coughs> So uh, you first find uh, the first observation times from Q and some freely observing objects, four different types of objects from the coordinates near the point Q0. And given the earliest observation set, we find a point and a direction in the forward light cone of this so that the Geodesic is containing the, this part of the geodesic is containing the earliest time observation set. And then uh, for any point Q in U, you can find the, the same here. So Q is in the geodesic. And then we can determine many like like geodesics in the X coordinates. So then, in other words, we can. Det since the light cone is a quadratic variety, it's an open set, then an open subset determines the whole light cone. So you can recover the light cone, and this is real analytics. We have given an open subset of it, and then you can recover the whole surface. And once you know this, you can recover the conformal metric, conformal type of the metric. Because of course, this is because of the behavior of the geodesics can be quite complicated. There are many exceptional cases when you have caustics, and like in the, double, the Einstein double ring. By the way, somebody mentioned yesterday this is the same as you see in a wine glass. You see, you see exactly the double Einstein ring. Okay, for the, to solve boundary value problems, one also defines, this is in an open space, the earliest light observation set. One can define the boundary light observation set. For instance, in this model, you are, let's say, in three dimensions, one time and two space dimension. You have the boundary here, and you have the sources which are containing the interior now. And you take the light cones starting from the points in the interior, and you intersect it with the set where you are measuring. There is a subset U, some set of the boundary, which includes time, where you are making measurements. And this is typical for boundary value problems. And also in this case, of course, we have reflections. So you consider the light cone and its reflections. And the collection of these sets, this is, uh, I will state the theorem more precisely in a, in a minute. The, this collection determines the topological, differential, and conformal structure of, uh, of the set S, where the sources are. So of course, in, in this case, we have reflection at the boundary satisfying Snell's law. So we can continue the geodesic starting at the point, at this point, say Q, as a broken geodesic. It's reflecting. And we also need uh, this, uh, in order to have, for most geodesics, transverse intersection, 
Otherwise, it gets very compli the, the situation gets very complicated with glancing rays and so on. Then uh, one assumes uh, uh, the, the simpler possible case where all the null geodesics start in the interior hit the boundary transversally. And the, the condition for being transversal is that the, the metric is in positive definite is for, the, for this vector, where this is mu is the unit normal. This is covariant derivative of w. w is in the tangent of the boundary, and it's null. And of course, it's, it's strictly, uh, strict null convexity means that this is always positive if w is non-zero. So we can define these light cones now that we had from before by taking the reflections. So we, we take broken null geodesics. And the main result is the following. Suppose you take a Lorentzian manifold of uh, dimension bigger or equal than two with strictly null convex boundary. You have it a proper time like time, sources inside with this compact, and the observations on the boundary, in a subset of the boundary U, which I had before here. And there are two assumptions. The first one is necessary, that this uh, uh, light, broken light cones, as I will say, starting at Q1 and Q2, are different if the points are different when measured in U. And there's another condition that it might not be necessary, but we need it for the proof, that the points in S and U are not conjugate points. So the exponential map is a diffeomorphism with the point on the boundary, not, in, not necessarily inside. You may have caustics inside or conjugate points, but not at the boundary. And the theorem is uh, with uh, Peter Hintz is that the, if you know you on the boundary, this is boundary information, and you know these cones, broken light cones, uniquely determines the topological differential conformal structure of the metric G. Again, this is this set is invariant and the multiplication of the metric by a conformal factor, by the same factor. So for an example of where the, there is a null convexity of the boundary, a strict null convexity, for instance, if in the, in the product case, and then the, the boundary is strictly convex in the usual sense. And it's not true that you can recover otherwise, in general, without this condition. It's easy to find examples. You take this set U, points Q1 and Q2. And here you can see the broken geodesics, the broken light cones coming from the two points are exactly the same in this case, because you have reflections and so on. It's exactly the same as sets. So you cannot distinguish between S1, this one here, and the, this S1 union S2. They give you exactly the same boundary information. But I repeat that the, the second condition, the second assumption might be possible to relax. And it will be interesting to relax. Okay, so what, uh, again, uh, uh, Matthew on Friday will cover much more complicated examples than this, include, including Einstein's equation, when you have sources. So here we have sources, a very simple nonlinear equation. I wrote it in two plus one dimensional space because it's, you can draw the picture. And the idea is uh, to, you want to recover the metric, as much of the metric as possible, and as much of the coefficient a as possible. And you take sources, 
And here there are three different types of sources with small coefficients. And for the people who are familiar with these type of things, they are conormal distributions, they are plane waves coming in, or distorted plane waves. An example is this one is coming in the x1 direction, sufficiently regular. So this is t minus x1 for if this is positive and zero if it's negative to the 11, so they are C10 or something like this. So very smooth waves, but small. And they interact with each, with each other, and we look at the triple interaction of these different waves. Triple is, in this case, related to the nonlinearity, of cubic nonlinearity. I put, I put this as a simple example again. I repeat, you can deal with very complicated ones like Einstein's equation, and this is the, the triple interaction term, where this is the inverse of the wave equation, the, the propagator. And we know how this operator acts to Hormander's theorem of propagation of singularities, how this propagates singularities, u1, u2, u3, how singularities, the product has singularities. You know how, uh, how this propagates those, sing those singularities. And what we prove, and this is the, what I mentioned before, that the nonlinearity helps when you interact these three waves, intersect at a point in three space-time dimension, and a new singularity is produced at the point Q. You are creating an artificial point source that produces the light cone coming from there. And when you intersect it with the data, the light observation set. So the singularities of the triple interaction term, it's called triple linearization here, this new term, this are corresponds to the linear term, gives rise to a new singularity the light cone coming, the forward light cone coming from the point Q, you're producing a new artificial source, and then uh, you, you can get the light observation set. And from that, you can recover the conformal factor of the metric. And so the, the, this is, the, the measurements are called the Dirichlet to Neumann map, when you have a boundary value problem, we're putting source on the boundary here, and we're measuring in Dirichlet, it's called Dirichlet, U here, and they measure it in another open set, the Neumann derivative. And the question is, can you recover the metric and the coefficient A from that information? And we can recover the metric, and A under some satisfies an equation. In particular, if A is constant, you can recover. You know, this type of theorems that you can prove, not only the conformal factor, by the way, in this case, because you can also, besides, look at the singularities of the, the new wave that comes out, you can also look at the strengths of the singularity, how singular it is. It was called in my colloquial analysis, called the symbol. And from the symbol, you can recover the conformal factor. So not only recover the conformal factor of the metric, but the metric itself. And these type of things uh, can be done also for Einstein's equation, similar type of analysis. Okay. So this is, uh, okay, so I was going to talk a little bit about the proof, but let me go to the second. Uh, part of the talk, I have only 15 minutes. Uh, the problem is, uh, the, other, the next inverse problem I want to tackle is you have the cosmic microwave background was one of the big discoveries. Uh, this is in, and we, from this map, the thermal energy at every, that you can see here at different points, can we recover uh, something about the, the structure of the universe? Again, the problem is, so you look at the propagation of photons starting at some point, 
believed to be 380,000 years ago approximately. And the problem, of course, is again, one of the problems is gravitational lensing that the, the light rays are very much distorted as they travel across the universe. So let me describe the, the problem more precisely mathematically, mathematically. So you have a Lorentzian manifold again, and you have a basis here that looks like this. Again, we're assuming time-oriented. There is a vector field that, where this is negative. This is time-lag that gives the direction of the future. So a geodesic models a photon if it is light-like and future-pointing. So that means the metric vanishes there, is the tangent vector to this cur curve is in the light cone and is uh, satisfies these conditions. So the, you're in the direction of the future. Okay, so uh, a point uh, in the tangent bundle and a, ve a, direct, a vector field it's called an observer. It's, if it, Z is a future pointing and has a linear product is exactly minus one. Okay. So you have a photon and you have is at the end point is the point P. Then the energy, this is what we are going to look at, the energy and the Newtonian velocity of this photon as measured at this point in the tangent bundle are given by these two expressions. This is standard. <coughs> and the energies of the C and B photons as measured at this point can be parameterized by the velocity. So the velocity gives the parameterization that satisfies these two conditions. And this is called the celestial sphere of this uh, point in the tangent bundle. So you take a point and the direction, is it all the directions of the sky of this point. Okay, so this, what we do, this, uh, we start here, we arrive at the point P after time L, and then at this point and this direction, you measure the energy of the photon, coming from this direction B in the celestial sphere. So these are the kinds of measurements that we're going to look at. And from that, so this is a, a map of CMB radiation in the celestial sphere of the Planck satellite. So it's similar to the picture we had before. This color indicates the temperature of the black body corresponding to the spectrum of the radiation. Okay. And uh, so the energy and the Newtonian velocity, again, I, this is repetition of what I said before. The measurement depends on the metric, the initial conditions, and the observer. And we fix those, and then the measurements are invariant under the, the following transformations. First of all, and the changes of variables. Of course, uh, this is all invariantly defined and also on the conformal transformations. So that's the, the best we can do. And this is, we have used this before, that the, the time-like geodesics of G and CG coincide. And now we have the model uh, that we're going to study. And this is the metric. It's a special metric the form minus dt squared plus a squared dA squared. And this warping, this is determines the warping, and strictly positive. And for instance, t to the two thirds different times in different models give the Einstein the Sitter cosmological model. And so the CMB photons are emitted with fixed energy in all direct, on all future pointing light-like directions on this surface. T0 is, as I said earlier, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And the photons are observed at a later time under an open set U1. 
How much time do I have? Okay, so the, the observer, rho dt here, measures the energy of the CMB photon coming from the direction B in the celestial sphere. So this is, and the point P is T1, is a, well, this is a T0, this is a T1. And Y is a point in U1 cross R3. And then what the, we look at the linearization of the problem. So we take family, one parameter family of Lorentzian matrix, and we have this matrix, and the, we look at the redshift. They compare the energy with the energy associated with the metric G epsilon. So it's a perturbation. And the linearized problem, of course, we want to, to actually find the metric, but first look at the linearization. Is we can compute it explicitly, and I this is the definition. And we want to determine the metric, in this case, the linearization of the metric. So the general, the inverse problem is to recover the metric itself. We are looking at the linearization of this problem up to the natural invariance, which are diffeomorphic invariance and conformal invariance. And this leads to something of interest in its own right in integral geometry called the light ray transform. So the X-ray transform is very well known. You integrate a function along lines. But here we're integrating a tensor because the linearization of a metric means perturbation of, is a perturbation is a tensor. And uh, on, not on, over all lines, but on, over, over the lines in the light cone or in general, in, depending on, in this case, will be a straight line. In Mikoski space will be the light cone, and there will be the deformed light cone in general. Okay. And so the, this problem was really considered by Sachs and Wolf, and it's called the Sachs-Wolf inverse problem as in some literature. We look at the linearization first, like they did, and then the linearization is, can be computed explicitly and leads to a, the light ray transform of a tensor. So you're integrating only along the light rays or the light, like geodesics. And F here, the, what you're integrating is, is the lead derivative or the derivative of the metric. And you want to determine a, this, a, derivative with respect to epsilon of the metric G epsilon. For the nonlinear inverse problem, you want to recover the metric G itself. Okay, so you have two, a slab of time here, T0 and T1, where you're making the measurement. This is the initial, this is the final. You have some uh, light, like geodesics, you integrate over this light like geodesics, what you want to recover. And the problem is to invert this transform. And it's very important in, in many applications to invert the X-ray transform. This is, a, is a, but for the development of CT scans, this is was crucial. And here we have like a CT scan of the universe. So we'd like to recover this tensor by, if we know this integral, this is what the linearized inverse problem leads to. So let me remind very quickly about the case of functions, which is simpler. This is tensors. Here, integration of tensors over the geodesic. So here is the integration of a function over the light rays, just a light in the light cone, in the standard Minkowski space. And there is a very important theorem that is also used for the inversion of the X-ray transform, which is the Fourier slice theorem. You compute the Fourier transform, and this leads uh, 
So this is this, this expression. And then, so if you know the, the light ray transform, then you know the Fourier transform on this plane, where tau plus c dot theta is equal to zero. So if you want to show that this is injective, if LF is equal to zero, then the Fourier transform is zero in the inside of the light cone, when, modulo, when tau is equal to modulo, modulo c. And that's what it called, yes. You cannot recover anything here, and the problem still remains what happens at the boundary of the cone. Okay, so this is, uh, if, if F is, happens to be compactly supported, then it's real analytic. If it's zero on this cone, then it's identically zero. But on Schwarz, to, this is a subtle problem. It's not in C0 infinity, we use analyticity very strongly. But on Schwarz, it's not true. If you take a function supported here, away from the, uh, on this, away from the light cone, on the, on the region where modulo tau is bigger than modulo c, you take the inverse Fourier transform of that, then you have that the Fourier transform is vanishes for all these vectors and LF is equal to zero without the function being zero. So it's not true that it's injective on Schwarz space. It's injective in C0 space. So it's a complicated transform. And one looks at the, what's called the normal operator, what one does a lot in matrices, take A star A, it's a better operator in general. We can, since I'm running out of time, let me, uh, do, do this quickly. It's a convolution, uh, which the delta function of t is equal to modulo of x divided by this singular factor. And then in terms of Fourier transform, is modulo c squared minus tau squared to some power divided by modulo c. So in the inside of the light cone is perfectly stable, stably invertible. This is non-zero. You cannot say anything here outside because this is just plus when this is positive, it's zero when it's negative, and that the light cone deteriorates. So this, uh, this uh, light ray transform is very interesting and, uh, and definitely running, on, running out of time. There are, the problem in the tensor case that we have is that there are invariants and the diffeomorphisms and conformal scaling. So this corresponds to the, the, this operator uh, annihilates these forms, ds omega, defined to be the symmetrical differential. This is a covariant derivative. And because of the conformal invariance, this is also zero. So this is a more complicated problem. Uh, what we have proven is that you, microlocally, that means you can recover the singularities, all the singularities of functions, not the function itself, but the singularities are stably recovered in general of a function supported inside the theory rays of the light cone. Uh, Iran Wang will give more details about what happens at the light cone in his talk, I believe. And, uh, and we can invert as much as possible modulo of this uh, conformal invariance, the C times G, and modulo diffeomorphism invariance. And I think I'm running out of time, and let me finish with that. Thank you.